you give us the keys, and then you remember the conversation, and you go and find him exactly where he's at. Oh, wow, that was great. Thanks, mate. You know? And in the end, he's still in pain. And in the end, probably you are still in pain too. And nothing has really changed from that particular interaction with the spirit. And what we want to do is change that. We want to change it so that all these interactions with the spirit cause changes. Oh, I was just going to ask about Anastasia. Yep. Anastasia is another spirit. Who have you heard of Anastasia? Quite a few. Okay. Anastasia is another spirit who, when I spoke with her first, she was in the fifth sphere of the spirit world, on the natural love path. She actually materialized, she decided the best way to teach people on earth, and particularly in Russia, was to materialize a human form and interact with them. And then to present herself as sort of like an ideal human. She, you know, she didn't present herself necessarily as a spirit, but rather like an ideal, an ideal human. And then she thought if she had interactions with another person who had the ability and funds and power to get this message out, that there would be huge changes on earth. And to be honest with you, she's dead right. She, there, there's been huge changes, particularly in Russia, uh, from the material that she was channeled. And so, um, when I say channeled, she was the medium of herself by just creating material form, which a spirit can do. And so, and, but it takes a spirit usually in a higher power, like it has to be a fourth or fifth or sixth sphere spirit or greater to do this on a consistent basis. And she also has a degree, a number of friends who are assisting her in this process. So in the books, her uncle, I think it is, or great uncle and grandfather, and that, they are actually spirits too. And even her child is a spirit who has materialized a child form just for the interaction of teaching. Now what happened a few, uh, about a year and a bit ago is we had a conversation with Anastasia about it because she really interested me in terms of what was going on. The first part of the conversation involved um, a, a, her own emotional condition, what was driving her to do these things. Because I've been the first person to realise that, for, for her, that she knew of, that had realised that she wasn't a person on earth, that she was actually a spirit materialising. So that was unique, and, that, and because I was speaking about her with some other friends, that drew her to us. And so one of the mediums there said, oh, she's here now, do you want to talk to her? And I said, yeah. Um, so we chatted about, about her feelings. And uh, we chatted about quite a number of things. One of the things was the soulmate issue, because she actually believed that the man on earth she was interacting with was her soulmate, even though they were separated by over 120 years years or so, or 170 years or so of space in terms of living on Earth. And, uh, and one of the things we talked about was that she, he wasn't her soulmate, and in fact her soulmate was standing directly behind her while we were having the discussion. And uh, she did not want to acknowledge her soulmate, uh, who was standing behind her. She could feel who it was, and she'd had a very damaging interaction with him while they were on Earth, and uh, so she didn't want to acknowledge him. And he was on the divine love path. So, so what happened firstly is she finished up over a period of three days, she came back each day and we had conversations and eventually she caught up with her soulmate and they were together on the third day when they came back to talk. During this time she trans she'd got onto the divine path and was in the seventh sphere of the spirit world and that was the last time I had a conversation with her, which was about around about 18 months ago. So she's certainly on the divine path and most probably, I would say now, a celestial spirit um, and progressing pretty well. She faces the same issue. Now, a few months ago, I was led to one of the people who she feels we, I could connect with and we actually sent him some material about the divine love path, which he hasn't responded to at this point. Um, so we'll see what happens. I have a strong feeling he will respond when he allows himself to get through his emotions about what we sent him. And uh, once that occurs, then I'll be able to hook up with the people on Earth who are linked to that movement. But uh, at the moment, Anastasia is going through this process, or she was at the time that I discussed with her last, going through this process of what to do about this materialization process. Because she wanted to continue teaching truth on Earth, but she realized that this process wasn't harmonious with God's desires, at this point in time. And so, uh, 
So she's worked, she worked through or was working through those issues the last time we conversed. So she wouldn't actually be able to take Earth now. Sorry? She wouldn't have to Earth now. And she was never on Earth really. She just materialised a form to interact, interact with people whenever they appeared. Oh. So she, she was constantly in this transition between the fifth sphere and Earth, uh, materialising a form to interact with people on Earth, as were the other spirits involved in the story. And this is why you haven't seen a book for some time from Latmin, because it, it, there's no more information to give. And, and the problem that he's facing at the moment is whether to construct some of his own information or not in order to, in order to continue the uh, series. Um, he's having deep arguments with the other man that we've met about that issue. Um, That's so, yeah. So, so the interaction of those two people at the moment. And that's why when you, you were there at his presentation and you could feel his doubts about the communication about Vladimir. So all that's happening there again is that people on Earth get hold of something, run with it, and, uh, and, then, and then if the source, the medium, if the spirit themselves changes their condition, what does the person on Earth do? Well, a lot of times they're very drawn into continuing constructing their own information uh, in order to perpetuate the income stream and so forth. Mm -hmm. Jade, she's turned his life upside down though. She has, and that was, that was a lot of her emotion she needed to work through. She spent the three days I was talking about crying most of them. Uh, she, she spent a lot of time in grief about the effect she's had on his life and also a lot of time in grief about how he's still got a lot of anger within him and she felt that now she's in this new condition she didn't know how to assist him so she is very very concerned about how to assist Vladimir um, and this is a problem that all of these spirits on the natural love path who interact with humans on earth eventually experience because they've been teaching untruths on earth or, or a, let's call it a subset of the truth on earth when they realize the real truth they then go through these emotions of realising they need to undo some of the teachings that they've taught. And it becomes very difficult because the people on earth have become so engrossed by them and so um, you know, engrossed in actually perpetuating them that it's very, very difficult for them to convince them to actually change. And so there's a lot of grief that those spirits experience and she, she's on earth, in earth time, which is a long time by the way in the spirit world, she was crying for three days about that, that one issue. Um, Did you, um, you mentioned that you had a I'm just about to finish actually, so this will probably be the last question. How many people, um, how many human beings can share the same spirit at the same time? For example, St. Francis uh, is going to James, and I, I felt touched by St. Francis at a time in my life. Yep. Is it possible that many people can, can be guided by that same spirit yep. at once? A celestial spirit is, is capable of thousands of, of simultaneous transactions. Uh, even actually the higher they rise in the celestial spheres, hundreds of thousands, and when you get to the soul union condition, millions and millions of simultaneous transactions, emotional transactions with people. So bearing that in mind, you are able to actually, as a celestial spirit, remain in the celestial spirit world, enjoying your life, and still guide a person on Earth. If you can think of it like this, you know a big, a big computer, like a supercomputer, processes information at billions and billions and billions of bit pieces of information in a second. So if you can think of yourself as processing one piece of information a second, and a celestial spirit processing a million pieces of information in a second. Can you see how the time they spend with you doesn't have to be very long for you to feel like it's a permanent connection? And that's how it is for the people of the spirits. So, so we could also therefore feel that we've been visited by spirits such as St. Francis and then he will move on. He doesn't necessarily need to stay around us. He doesn't necessarily need to stay around him. He will, he will choose certain people to guide and once he chooses somebody to guide, he will often spend a lot of time around those people. 
But when you have a longing for him or a, or a rapport with him, he will often feel very drawn into that interaction, just like you would. Like, so you might have a really close friendship. Like I might have a really close friendship with Brian. But you come into my life and I really like you, so we actually have an interaction for a period, but then you decide you are, you're interested in some other things. So then the rapport between us will obviously stop. We haven't, you know, it hasn't stopped because we got angry with each other or upset with each other or any of those things. It's just stopped because there's different desires now leading us in different directions. And that happens all the time in the spirit world. Now what I'm going to stop now is we'll stop for uh, 30 or 40 minutes. And I'm going to continue this discussion with the questions because uh, obviously I haven't covered much of the material. And so we're going to continue the discussion uh, uh, answering those questions as well and answering the spirit questions that have been directed as well. So that's good. Uh, how have you found the discussion so far? Has it been quite interesting? Thanks. What's going on? Good. All right. Well, now what I'd like to do is actually focus on um, the limitations of the mediums and healers, if you like, in terms of receiving messages. What we've done a lot is we've, uh, I know a lot of the spirits who are here have been talked a fair bit about the discussion that we've had up to now. And so what we want to do now is focus a bit more on the mediums and, and helping you. The, the, important section, the important part of this session really is that what we're covering now is just really a summary or an overview of what we'll be covering in detail in these monthly sessions that we'll do with you if those of you who are mediums want to come along to these sessions. So the first thing that uh, later in the session we'll be asking how many people feel that they want to come along on a regular basis because obviously how many coming is going to determine the location where we can actually meet together. And so we'll determine all those things in a bit. But what I'd like to do for the next hour or so at least is talk more about the limitations uh, that we have as mediums and as healers and look at the emotional condition that we have. So this is on the second page of your handout that I've given you. And uh, I'd like to focus a lot on this session. Now, from our discussion yesterday and our discussion today, there's something that's been coming out over and over and over again. And what's that? Soul condition. Does that make sense? So remember soul condition. Remember soul condition determines your law of attraction. And soul condition also determines your spirit attractions. So therefore if you're um, a medium, soul condition is going to very much determine the effectiveness of your mediumship. And if you're a healer, soul condition is going to very much determine that. Does that make sense? So what we want to do now is focus on the soul condition, firstly of mediums. Now one of the major problems that most mediums have, and most mediums and psychics that you visit will have this problem, and that is the problem with humility. It's going to back this off a little. It's so a problem, and perhaps if you can just switch that off because that's cool. And it's a problem with humility. Now, what are the problems with humility? Well, most people who are psychics or mediums and who have developed their skills and are perhaps using their skills in a cash, on a cash basis or in using their skills maybe in a spiritualist church or something like that, the majority of them feel that they have the gift because of some special unique quality within themselves that has to do with their soul condition. And they are right. It does have something to do with the soul condition. But they then make the second assumption, and that is the assumption that I must be in really, really good soul condition if I can do something that a lot of other people cannot. And that's when mediums come to grief. So all of you who are wanting to develop your mediumship, it's very, very important for you to develop this quality of humility. Now, can you remember the definition I've given you of humility? What was it? Can you remember? The willingness to feel your feelings. Okay, yes, a strong desire to feel your emotions, right? A strong desire to feel and experience them. Now, 
for most mediums, most mediums have been developed along the new age type of beliefs. Or, if we talk about mediums in a complete sense, there are many mediums who are called prophets in a born-again Christian sense. All right? And they are still mediums. They're the same, per same kind of person. They're channeling information from spirits through themselves to another. And the biggest problem that they face is this problem of humility. Humility will govern the type of spirits you attract. Humility will also govern the type of information you can receive. The more humble you are, the wider the variety of information you'll be able to receive. The more haughty you are, or the more um, controlling you are, or the more resistant to emotions you are, the less information you'll be able to receive. And most mediums get into this state where they believe they have this special, unique gift, and they become so proud of that unique gift that they then start thinking that, that the information they are receiving is actually their own. Do you know what I mean by that? They actually start believing that all this wonderful information that's passing through them is because of them. That they just know. They just know all these things about everybody. And they start feeling that they just know because it's coming from inside of themselves. And as soon as you start getting into that state as a medium, you are going to be attracting spirits who are in very low and poor conditions. The reason why is, really what is happening, remember with, with spirit communication, this is really what is happening. Here's me on the earth, my soul, my uh, spirit material bodies, right? Here's the spirit. This spirit is actually communicating, and it depends on what condition the spirit's in and what condition I am in as to how it's communicating. But for most people, this spirit is communicating through the spirit to material body connection, which is called the silver cord. It's communicating into this physical form, right? So what's actually happening is all of the information you're, that's coming out of your mouth, the majority of it, if not all of it, is actually not yours. It's actually the spirit who's with you. And in fact, if you're a good medium, none of the information coming out of your mouth while you're doing your mediumship will be actually yours. And when I say a good medium, a medium who's cleared their emotional condition to the point of abundance with God is a good medium. Right? And when you're at that state, nothing coming out of your mouth will be yours. Nothing will be influenced by anything inside of you when you're doing the mediumship. Now that is a very powerful state to be in, in terms of transmitting information from the spirit world to the earth. Until that point, we're going to be in various degrees of interruption to the pureness of the message, if that makes sense, depending on the condition of the spirit. So if the spirit is in the celestial spheres and I'm in the second sphere, then obviously I'm going to be modifying the information quite a lot, aren't I? But if the spirit's in the second sphere and I'm in the second sphere, then obviously there's going to be a lot more purity of information because our two conditions match a lot more. Does that make sense? But as soon as I as a medium start believing that it's all me is the reason why this is all occurring, now I'm setting up this constraint upon the spirit world that any spirit who's doing it for uh, loving purposes is probably not going to be drawn as much to me. Can you see why? Because we're not respecting where the information's coming from. How would you like to talk to, like if I talk to Brian and then Brian talked to Raya, and, and Brian then claimed that the information I gave him was his own. Right? Now, if I, I would after a while start questioning, am I going to keep talking to Brian? <laughs> Or am I just going to wait till Raya's ready and I'll just talk to her? Wouldn't I? And bypass Brian altogether because his condition is that he's modifying my information. Right? And he then is claiming it as his own. 
That doesn't sound very good. And then let's say, let's add another factor into it. He's also charging her for it. And I'm, and I'm giving it to him for free. Right? Can you see what's going on now? Like lots of different things see I'm getting factored in. There's a, That's right. And that's why none of the DVDs that you're getting, none of the CDs you're getting, and none of these talks are copyrighted. And you can copy, photocopy, do whatever you want. And the reason why is because this is not mine. Does that make sense? None of it's mine. And in the end, you will come to see truth is not yours either. You, it doesn't, you don't own it. Right? Now, if a spirit's connecting with a person who's charging all the time, then this a lot of spirits get, particularly celestial spirits, get quite upset with this process. Can you see why? Like they're giving this information for free that they have received freely and then somebody is charging for it. Straight away that sets up a dynamic, doesn't it? Now a lot of people then argue, and on the natural love path you hear this argument a lot. You've got to have some kind of financial transaction, right, in order for people to value the information. You hear that quite a lot, right? And it's totally false, by the way. If a person doesn't value the information, or they only value the information based on money, then what does that tell you about them? They're only interested in the money, in the end, aren't they? So if I put a thousand, so I'm sure if, if we said a thousand dollars a weekend, right, in the end these courses would be in high demand. Because everybody thinks thousand dollars must be worth a lot, you know? And this is the thing that's happened with JZ Knight, like, charging $5,000 for the week or whatever. That's a lot of money, is it not? And then they start saying, well, if your attraction doesn't bring it in, then obviously you've got problems with your life and so forth. And honestly, this is not, very, this is not a very honest thing to do because how does a person in Africa pay $5,000 US dollars to learn truth? They're, not, like, they're, they're never going to see $5,000 US dollars if they, if they live 20 lifetimes in Africa. Right? Let alone one. So how can you then limit the information to them? You see, this is the problem that we have a lot of times. Now, the spirits that are attracted to that kind of processing are all going to be on the natural love path. Divine love path spirits are not going to be attracted to that. Divine love path spirits are not going to be attracted to a person who's not humble. So one of the key things that we'll be developing in you over the next 12 months, if you want to come along, is your humility. Which means we're going to be addressing this issue of your willingness to experience your own emotions. Right? And we're going to be quite confronting with that. Because without that, you don't have good mediumship, whether you believe you do or not, even if you've had it from a child. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Good. So humility is a major, major important emotion to develop. And you can see under the points of humility that I've, that I've listed there that many, many me mediums believe they are in a much, much better condition than their true condition from God's perspective. And they believe that because they can see spirits and talk to spirits that they must have a far better condition than the average person around them. And many of them believe with that and go forward even further with that belief that if you try to correct their emotional condition, they get very upset and angry with you. Right? Now, if you are one of those persons, you are not going to enjoy our sessions coming up with mediumship. Does that make sense? Because the sessions are going to confront you on lots of levels. And in particular, they're going to confront you emotionally. A lot of the exercises we'll be doing in, this med in these mediumship sessions that are coming up will be based around developing your humility, developing your resistance, getting rid of your resistance to experiencing emotion, and getting rid of your resistance to hearing new truth, and getting rid of your resistance, which is called doubt, to hearing truths that are of much higher nature than the Earth that's actually capable of receiving currently. We want to get groups of mediums in that condition, 
where they can actually receive these higher truths. The only way that's going to happen is for your condition to get very, very close to a celestial spirit's condition. That's the only way it's going to happen. And so what we want to do is focus on helping that occur. And humility is one of the other, one of the main qualities. Another quality is this quality of modesty. Does everyone understand the difference between modesty and humility? Anybody has it a guess with that? Modesty is recognizing your own limitations. It's a bit different than humility, because humility you will have and retain even when you have no limitations. In other words, when you become a celestial spirit here on earth yourself, you will have very few limitations and you will still have humility. Modesty is understanding where you're currently at and what your limitations are of where you're currently at. Does that make sense? Whereas humility is something you will retain as a quality all of your life. Now, the, the quality of modesty is so important as a medium. Because if you develop modesty, what you're doing is you're knowing that, hang on a sec, I've still got this emotion of anger in me with men. So anything that I channel for a man is going to be tainted with my emotion of anger towards men. And it's a modest point of view to see that. Does that make sense? So if I've got angry with men inside of me and I'm attracting a spirit who has no anger with men at all to talk to this person who happens to be a man, what's going to happen is their lovely message to this man will get modified through my anger with men and give delivered to this man. And if I don't understand that limitation, I'm going to be drawn into saying that actually, no, this spirit said that to you. This spirit said that to you. You've got to listen to that now. <laughs> and I actually start dumping my men anger, my emotion that's unresolved within me, onto this man who I'm meant to be helping. Is that a loving... It's not a loving prospect, is it? Now, let's flip it over. Let's say I'm actually doing some mediumship to help a spirit. And a lot of spirits are surrounding me, and there happens to be quite a few male spirits surrounding me. So they come along to talk to me. What are they going to feel from me if I've got this anger with men? My anger with men is going to be, dump, be dumping on them. It's going to be quite unpleasant for them to stay in my company, even though I'm telling them divine truth. It's going to be quite unpleasant for them to stay in my company while I've got that emotion. Does that make sense? And so they'll want to maybe leave, or they'll only be able to stay a short time, or they'll listen to you and then realise, oh, hang on a sec, she's saying a lot of that thing and stuff because she's actually angry with men. Like, it's got nothing to do with truth. They don't want to hear your personal truth. They want to, they're, they're sick to death of hearing personal truth. Can you understand that? If you've listened for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for people's truth, all sorts of truth, like, you know, like, if you, if you imagine here on earth that you investigated a hundred religions. Are you going to be very tempted to investigate the 101st if, if the person doing the investigation with you is angry with you? <laughs> of course not, right? Because you've already got all this emotion of just being tired of hearing this personal crap come from everybody. Does that make sense? And this is how a spirit would feel. So even if I'm helping the spirit, I need to have modesty. Just because it's helping a spirit, it does not mean you are better than them. And just because you can channel to a person who can't channel, it doesn't mean you're better than that person either. And if you believe you are, you've got a problem that needs to be resolved if you want to be at one with God. Does that make sense, dear? And so it's very important these two qualities are developed in the medium. Now the problem is, on the earth today, is mediums get glorified many times. Is that not the case? So, imagine for the moment, you have a problem with humility. You start channeling some really good information. Let's say you have progressed from the first sphere to the third sphere, now you're starting to connect with some really good stuff, right? What's going to happen? People around you are going to be very impressed, are they not? And when they start getting impressed with you, and you still have this problem with humility, what are you going to start doing? Can you see that you might start getting to feel like, yeah, I'm pretty good, eh? 
I'm pretty good. This is going good. I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah, I think I'll start charging now, actually, kind of thing. Yeah, this is pretty good, right? But I'm in high demand and, you know, it's not going to be donation-based anymore. I'm going to say 5,000 bucks a pop now, you know. You know, do it, do it, you know, one of these popular medium styles that are around today who are charging mega bucks for their services, right? Now, what's happening is your condition is worsening, if that happens, right? Because you're getting into a haughty state. And when you get into a haughty state, there's no more humility. You're going to stop connecting with spirits who are willing to transmit that kind of information. Can you see how a quality that you might have had at the beginning with your mediumship might change when you start getting the glory that comes your way? So, one of the things you're going to have to work on quite a lot is how do you respond to glory? Do you want it? Because if you want it, you are going to have some major issues down the track dealing with your mediumship. Right? So it's a very important factor to bear in mind. So these two qualities are a must to develop. They are a must to develop. And they are the qualities that we are actually going to focus on more so than any other quality. They are the qualities we're going to focus on. We're going to push all of your buttons in those two areas if you are willing to, do, if you're wanting to do mediumship. And the reason why is you cannot help any person on earth or any person in the spirit world with a pure heart if you lack those qualities. Does that make sense to everyone? It's a really important factor. Really important factor is those two qualities. A less so much of a factor is your belief systems. But they are still very important. When I say it's less of a factor, if I have humility, then I'm willing to listen to a person confronting my belief. But if I don't have humility, then I won't let my beliefs be confronted. Can you see that? Now, many mediums have belief systems that come from sixth sphere or from natural love spirits. That's just a byproduct of the fact that there are far more spirits on the natural love path than there are on the divine love path. So there are going to be more spirits communicating those beliefs to earth and because those beliefs are lower beliefs in terms of the truths, they are the ones with the most rapport with people on earth. Is that, you can see that? Rapport, remember, is created by conditions, soul conditions. So if my soul condition is second sphere, I'm, connecting, I'm going to connect to second sphere soul conditioned spirits and what truths do they have compared to a celestial spirit? They might have very little compared to a celestial spirit, right? So I will start transmitting truths that are actually not true if I stay in that condition. And if I'm not aware of their condition and aware of what beliefs are actually a part of that condition, then I will start transmitting belief systems to the earth and the earth is full of false belief systems. And you know what? The spirit world is full of spirits in pain because of the false belief systems they picked up while they are on earth. So we want to not do that anymore. We don't want to transmit these false belief systems to earth. What we want is we want the truth to be transmitted to earth which is going to mean that our belief systems, whatever they are, are going to be confronted. And if you're not willing to confront your belief systems, then you're going to find development on the divine love path very difficult. Because most belief systems are of the, the mind. They are of the intellect. You follow me? A desire for you to know is what creates a belief system. On the divine love path, you are going to lose your desire to know. Instead, what you are going to do is you are going to experience rather than know. And then you will really know in your heart, in your soul. That makes sense to everyone, doesn't it? Yeah. So, any belief systems are of the mind. So therefore, what's going to happen is your mind will get in the way of everything you do. Now when you're channeling, there are a couple of different types of channeling that I mentioned later. 
And when you're channeling, you, you might be doing trance channeling. The trance channeling is when the spirit form and the soul of the person steps back from the physical body and the spirit actually connects and overcloaks the physical body. And the voice might even change and everything might change. You know, you, the mannerisms will change of the person and everything, right? That's called a trance mediumship. Now, there is a common misconception on earth that when you're doing trance mediumship, you're the most accurate. But what have I said? All transmission is dependent upon soul condition. So why would your accuracy be different? You see, it's the soul condition that determines your accuracy. Right? Not whether you're doing trans mediumship or not. Now, a lot of spirits enjoy trans mediumship because they don't have to wait for you to relay everything. In other words, I, let's say I'm a spirit, Brian's the medium, Ray is the person he's talking to. I say to Brian, hello Brian, it's lovely to see you. And then I've got to wait for Brian to say to Ray, oh, he, he says, hello Ray, it's lovely to see you, or whatever, right? And then I, oh, and now Ray, uh, please look at your emotion about such and such. And Brian then has to say, well, he's saying, please look at your emotion, Ray, about such and such. Now I'm, I'm waiting all this time, right? Now, it'll be far better if I could just overcloak Brian and just say all of these things straight to Ray. Does that make sense? Yes. Obviously, the communication is far more effective in, from my point of view because I can say all of these things quite rapidly rather than waiting for this, tra you know, this transmission acknowledgement and then I've got to go again and, and it's a stop and start process. So obviously, transmediumship has its benefits for me as a spirit. So a lot of spirits love doing it. But don't you believe as a medium that it means you're more accurate? Because the accuracy of the information is still dependent upon your soul condition. You follow me? Yeah. All right. And Jay, where's free will in that process? Well, I'm allowed to step back from my spirit form. That's just me going out of body like I do every night when I go to sleep. Right? So every night that you go to sleep, you go out of body. Your soul and your spirit body, you're in the spirit world, you're doing things up there, setting up events having a chat with some friends, doing all those kind of things. Yeah, you're doing much more, by the way, but I won't mention all those other things that you're doing. But what actually happens is you are out of body at that point. Your body is in a state where another spirit could use it if you chose to do so. Now, as a medium, you can choose to go out of body at any time and your, your body can be used by a spirit directly. Right? And this happens all the time, by the way, for many people who do trans mediumship. And you will develop in your mediumship to the point where you will feel comfortable with doing that. Carol? Actually, is that dangerous? Like, could you just not like, stay there and not get <laughs> there? Their connecting with your body is totally dependent upon your will. So, ones like, say, Barbara and some like that on Earth, it has become dangerous for them because, say, Barbara's free will is that. I'm going to be permanently connected to this six-sphere spirit. And so the majority of the time, he isn't himself anymore. He's the six-sphere spirit using his body. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that can be quite a dangerous thing to do. Not from a physical point of view, but more from a developmental point of view. Because what we start doing is we start assuming, because I can do all of these wonderful <coughs> things, and I can levitate, and I can do this, and I can do that, that it's me that's doing it. And remember what I said about humility? It ain't you doing it, it's the spirit doing it, right? And if we start thinking it's me, we stop developing ourselves. <coughs> and if you stop developing yourself, what happens then? You get stuck, and say Barbo is one of those people who are stuck in a certain condition on earth, the first fear condition on earth, but who is a very, very good connection with the spirit who keeps him in a six fear state for the majority of the time. So that's definitely possible for you too, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> if I'm not sleeping... Can we wait for the mic? Yeah. After yesterday, I didn't sleep practically at all yep. last night. Yeah. But I want to know, when I'm lying there going, I wish I was sleeping, I'd like to be sleeping, and I thought I tried just about every trick in the book last night, but I woke up extremely tired this morning, does my spirit body still leave? Even if I'm not in a sleep state? No. That's why you wake up tired. 
because your body doesn't feel refreshed and your spirit form doesn't feel refreshed. So uh, look at the emotional reasons why you couldn't allow yourself to sleep because there are emotional reasons. Then it's to do with the emotions you were facing yesterday, as you know. Yeah, just you can't turn off, but so go into it emotionally. Have, like many of you will wake up three o'clock. This is an aside, but many of you will wake up three o'clock in the morning feeling quite distressed from a dream, wanting to go back to sleep. My suggestion is don't do that. You wake up three o'clock in the morning processing emotion. Process the emotion. You know, cry for two hours. Then you'll feel like sleeping for sure, <laughs> right? And let yourself do that. But just allow yourself to do it when it comes is for the emotional side. But getting back to the spirit. So, so with our, with our, with the mediumship, we need to make sure that if whatever type of mediumship we're doing, whether it be automatic writing, whether it be direct mediumship, whether when, when I say direct mediumship, whether it be relayed type of a mediumship, whether it be trance mediumship, or whether it be soul to soul mediumship, which is where you will develop to, um, any form of mediumship, my soul modifies the contents of the message. So can you see why getting rid of a lot of your emotional baggage is so important? Right? Because if, if you're, the problem with being a medium is that people will look to you for accurate information. In the process of that, if the information, and you love your mediumship, right? It's an enjoyable gift to, to utilize because you want to help people. But if your soul is modifying the information going to that person, then obviously now you have a culpability as a teacher for what that person is receiving. Now that has its own law of compensation issues associated with it. If your intention is to retain your emotions in a, in a first fear condition, and do that, then there will be law of compensation issues associated with that. Does that make sense? The key is to not be afraid of them, of the law of compensation issues, because they're all based around your intention. If your intention is to deal with your emotions, and your intention is to be modest, then what will happen is you'll say to yourself, ah, oh, this guy's come along to do some mediumship with me, and I could do a channeling, and I can feel the spirit there that wants to talk to him, but I must make a proviso at the start, or a, let's call it a disclaimer, and that is, I'm sorry, my friend, but I am actually very angry with men. So some of this mediumship that I'm going to do for you may come across quite angry with men, and if you feel that, just discount that, because that's probably me. <laughs> it's not this spirit. All right? However, if you're channeling his mother, who is still angry with men, it might be awesome to give him that message, right? <laughs> because if, in terms of accuracy as a medium, if his mother's angry with men, you're angry with men, then you're a great medium to give him what for, right? right? <laughs> and can transmit the message as mum is transmitting it. So can you see you need to know what your condition is and also understand the condition of the person? David, let's just be honest. But wouldn't you be channeling or attracting spirits that are similar to your soul condition? Not always, because it, remember, in the section that I haven't to go on through and I won't, I've actually said that there's a, there's, the law of attraction is working to actually draw who is going to communicate with each person. So, I'm the person who's visiting the medium. Let's say Brian's the medium, and let's say Tristan's the spirit. Right? All of us are being attracted together because of our soul conditions. So, so that being said, like my condition, not just the medium's condition, is determining which spirit is talking to me. You follow me? Yes. Because of that, it's the amalgamation of my condition, the medium's condition, and the spirit's condition that will determine the content of the message. So it's not all just about the medium's condition, but my focus is on the medium in terms of developing their condition. But the condition of the person coming to the medium and the condition of the spirit coming to the medium will determine the contents of the message. Now, if you're a clear medium, you will be able to say, oh, wow, your mum's here, mate. And she is so angry, hey? She's really angry with men, right? You know? And you'll be able to say all these things because you're feeling that from her and you'll be able to accurately describe her condition to the person you're helping and then you'll be able to say the message and then you can put a proviso on the end of 
Yeah, but I don't know if I'd be listening too much to her at the moment because she's really angry with men, right? And she needs to do with that anger. And you may actually talk, be able to talk to the spirit about her anger even and help her if she wanted help. And you then are really effective as a medium. Can you see the interaction and how it's occurring? It's the law of attraction. So let's say there was a medium in front of all of you right now transmitting information to you. Well, what determines the contents of that information are all of your amalgamated law of attraction based on your soul condition. The spirits, whoever they are, wanting to connect to you and their soul condition and the soul condition of the medium will determine what information comes across to you. So, let's say we had a whole room full of angry people. What kind of spirits are we generally going to attract? A whole group of angry spirits. And let's say the medium is in a similar state. So we're going to have a pretty interesting time with that, aren't we? Can you see that? But then as our, as our condition rises, and let's say, another, what often happens with mediumship is everyone who gathers in a group is, is sort of inquisitive but in a, in a very uh, physical and, um, what do you say, uh, making fun of way, inquisitive. So let's say that's the general spirit of the audience. What kind of spirits are going to be attracted? Spirits who feel much the same way, who want to make fun of you. Uh, and if the medium's in a good condition, they'll be able to transmit that through you and you'll get a very interesting interaction. Now, this is all described in all sorts of mediumistic type of literature where these kind of events are occurring. But the big issue is for most, we don't see the law of attraction in the spirit world whereas the spirits do. So when we're sitting here, we don't see our collective condition. But our, our spirit friends can see every single emotional injury in every single one of you. Right? And the collective emotional condition of every single one of us adds together right, to create a general soul condition for this group. And that soul condition for this group attracts a group of spirits who want to either manipulate that condition or feel similar to that condition. And there'll be other spirits who are very interested in that condition. And there'll be all sorts of spirits attracted. The issue for you is you can't see them. For most of us, we can't see them but they see you. So it's very much easier for a spirit to describe to you what's going on at the soul level than it is for you to describe what's going on at the soul level here. Does everyone follow that? Matt, you had a question? Or? So the spirits can see the, um, the soul condition of everybody, is that dependent on where the, the spirits are in their development or can they just see that by their very nature? If they're a celestial spirit, they see your actual soul condition. If they are a spirit on the natural love path and particularly a first sphere spirit, what they see is the colours in your body and they know that that colour represents that emotion. Or the way they look at it more is, that's a colour I can use to my benefit or that's not a colour I can use to my benefit. That's how they see it. So they don't even really see your soul condition. All they see is the injury and how they can manipulate it. So let's say you're a quite developed person spiritually. However, and in love you're quite developed. However, you've got a problem with alcohol. Every time you, know, you go out to drink, you have a tendency to want to just get blotto. And that's driven by a sad emotion in you that you haven't released yet. So that's the case. So a spirit won't see all of your lovely qualities and all of the nice things. That a first fear spirit won't see all that. A celestial spirit will, but a first fear spirit won't. What they will see is, eh, he likes getting drunk. I like getting drunk too. Let's get together, right? And so what he will do is influence you into places that will actually cause you to drink more and then overcloak you so that he can have a drink as well and feel the same emotions. So I can be very mediumistic and actually be there getting drunk at the pub for the sake of the spirit who's with me. And that's why many people go totally unconscious and yet they're still standing up drinking. Because no longer is the person connected to their body anymore. Mostly it's the 
spirit connected to the body just forcing more down. Right? And being out of character too. And being out of character too, because it's actually the spirit's character that's being expressed. Right? So that's what's happening a lot of times with those kind of things. So a person can be very mediumistic and that medium is, that mediumistic ability can be used by spirits to get what they want if I've got a certain soul condition. Right? So it all gets back to soul condition. It all gets back to that. So the key is, if you want to develop your mediumship, is to develop your soul condition. That's the key. And it's quite simple when you understand that. All I've got to do is develop the soul condition. If I'm attracting some angry spirits, okay, I must be feeling some rage in here that I'm not recognising, so what I need to do is start releasing this and getting connected with it and releasing it. Once I release that, do you think I'm going to attract those same spirits? Nowhere near as much. They might still be attracted because they might want to have a chat with me to, let, to ask me how I did it, but they won't be connected to me trying to make me angry anymore because it's impossible. They can't make me angry anymore. <coughs> All right. Now, the most... The most important thing, even more important than humility, modesty, and beliefs, is is God's love in your development. And when I say God's love, I'm not just talking about receiving divine love. I'm talking about also reflecting divine love in your life and having a desire to connect to a personal relationship with God. That is the most important thing that is going to affect your ability to com communicate accurately. Now remember I said earlier in the discussion that it's the divine love laws that are the highest of all laws. And remember I also said that if the soul isn't developed in divine love, then you can't receive information about divine love laws at the soul level. So can you see that if you haven't received divine love, you're going to be automatically limited to natural <coughs> love or moral teachings or what's lesser than that in terms of your communication. But if you're developed in God's love and you're receiving divine love and you're working through that emotionally, what's going to happen is you're going to attract all sorts of spirits in all sorts of areas, but they will feel your love, being God's love being reflected through you, it will become your love. They'll feel your love being transmitted and they'll be very much attracted to you for getting assistance. So, for, so those of you mediums who would love to help spirits, it's very, very important that you develop yourself in love. Because it's an act of love to help someone. All right. Now the other thing that's a major factor, and by the way, these points apply to healers, and to mediums, all right? So these points really apply to both. But the other main factor, obviously, which is connected to humility, is your emotional condition. <coughs> now, the problem with most mediums on earth is they have he very heavy judgments about emotional condition. <coughs> And the reason why they have very heavy judgment is because almost every single spirit on the natural love path has heavy judgments about emotions. So what's happening for most mediums is the spirit who's looking after them and nurturing their condition, their guide if you like, has huge judgments about you becoming emotional. And that spirit now is impressing heavily on this medium. And the medium, therefore, often has heavy judgments about you being emotional. Now, if that's the case, how are they going to help you with your emotions? Well, what they're going to say to you is, oh, write down what you're feeling, roll it all up in a little thing, and burn it, and then you're done. <laughs> or things like that, to that nature, right? They are going to suggest to you that dealing with emotions is an intellectual process because for that natural love spirit it has been an intellectual process. But that is not the way for you to develop your mediumship. The problem is that most mediums are so focused on not developing their emotional condition, from detuning from their emotional condition, from staying in their intellect, that that severely limits what kind of information can be transmitted to them. 
It also, if I'm a, if I'm a healer, it severely limits my ability to heal. Because again, if I have certain emotions of judgment in me, let's say I have judgment of a single mother. A mother, a mother has a baby, but she's not married. Right? That's my judgment. I'm a healer. And this mother who's not married comes along wanting to be healed. What's the main thing she's going to get? My judgment. And if I can't actually recognise my own emotional condition and my judgement and actually say to her, well, in modesty, I don't know if I'm ready to treat you yet because, because I have this condition inside of me that prevents me from treating you. If I'm not willing to say that in modesty, then I'll probably try to treat her, but it's not going to be of much benefit to her receiving all this judgement at the same time. So can you see how your emotional condition will have a huge effect upon the effectiveness of what you're doing, whether you're a healer or a medium? Yeah. Now there's many other things I've mentioned in that list, so you can have a look at those at your own time in terms of subpoints to each of these things. What we're going to be doing in the developmental classes is we are going to be focusing on those things with your development. Right. We're going to be focusing on your judgments that you have the feelings that you have, the beliefs you have, how much modesty you have, how much humility you have, and I'm going to trigger those buttons quite a lot. And if I'm not around, James is going to. So that's what we want to do over the 12, the 12 months for those of you who want to be more involved with mediumship. Now, rather than go through the different types of mediumship and the different types of healing that are possible, I just want to explain perhaps how it generally works and then you'll understand what's going on in terms of the possibilities. Here's you, the medium. Here's my spirit body as the medium. Here's my material body. Here's the spirit who's wanting to connect with me in their spirit form. There's their soul. <coughs> There's their spirit form. Remember their soul condition controls what kind of information they can give to you. Remember your soul condition controls what kind of information you can receive from them. Now, usually most mediumship occurs by the person here in the spirit world relaying a message into your mind or in some cases into your ear, which you may actually hear, and then you, through your mind, your mind, your spirit body's mind controls your brain and you express that message to the world in some way. Probably to a person that's sitting opposite you or something like that. Or if it's a, if it's a automatic writing, the spirit will actually control your spirit body's mind to control your brain to control your arm and you'll just start writing that way if it's automatic writing so you could call that type of mediumship just normal mediumship trans mediumship is when you step back from your spirit form from your material form sorry so here's this here's a super cord connection you step back from that it's like you going into a sort of a semi sleep state or what people would call the trance state. And the spirit body, they can then connect through this silver cord connection straight into your physical body. In other words, they can, to an extent, take over your physical body. Take over your voice, take over your mind, and away it goes. And sometimes you can observe it, so you can step back and observe the whole process, or you can actually be having a conversation with another person in the spirit world while it's actually going on. So that's another method that can be used. But the most powerful method of communication, which is not yet being done on Earth very much at all, is a soul-to-soul -soul communication. And that's what we want to develop our divine love mediums into doing. Soul-to-soul -soul communication. What happens there is huge packets of information flow from one soul to the other soul at, light, at, at super, super light speeds. 
In other words, huge amounts of information occur over a period of just tiny little gaps in time. Right. And so a spirit can then burst you with this information that you spend the next five hours writing. Right? And I've only spent, ten, let's say, one second of our time transmitting it to you. And that is a very effective form of communication. In fact, that's the type of communication you will have with everyone around you when you're a celestial spirit. And you are a celestial spirit on earth when you become born again, when you make that transition between the seventh and the eighth sphere. This will become your ability to transmit to other people here on earth using that method. Also back to spirit? And also back to spirit, yes. Um, They have to be in the same and uh, not they don't have to be in the same soul condition as the transmitter. But but the closer this gets to the closer you get, the medium gets to an atonement condition, the more information can be transmitted at once. And then when you get to the soul condition of where you're where you're at one, obviously now you can be in constant contact. It's great, yeah, there's, there's literally thousands or there's millions and millions and millions of books in the spirit world, none of which are here on earth because there's no medium that can transmit them. There's literally millions of books on scientific things that there's no scientist here on earth in a, who's a good enough medium that can transmit them. There's literally millions of books on spiritual development, on the natural love and divine love paths, but nobody here on earth is in good enough condition to actually transmit them. When you're getting that condition, your ability to do that. So many of you will finish up writing books that are not your books. They'll actually be books in the spirit world that are being transcribed through you and, and that will help this, this gathering of information where the spirit world and the earth world gets closer and closer until we are a seamless thing. It's a seamless thing. So what's actually going to happen over the coming years is we'll get to the point where there'll be this soul-to-soul -soul transmission. Once that, occur once that starts occurring, there will also be another thing occurring, and that is you'll be actually sitting here on Earth having conversations with spirits who are also sitting with you on Earth. There's another thing that will occur as well, and that is you will be sitting here on Earth out of body as a group having conversation with spirits in the spirit world and you'll be totally conscious of what's going on. Those things are all possible. And they will all become possible through the development of soul condition. Does that make sense, Sarah? Yes. So it's really exciting, eh? Hey? Very, very exciting. There's huge amounts of really, really good information in all these different areas that you can think of. Music, art, poetry, all these different areas that all could be transmitted to Earth if people were in the condition of doing it. Yeah. I just wanted to ask regarding Eckhart Tolle and, and the books that he is writing at the moment. Where does that fit in with uh, Almost the every book that's written on Earth and almost every piece of music that's produced on Earth and almost every piece of poetry that's produced on Earth is inspired through collaboration. Collaboration with the spirit connection. And this is the problem when you get, and I think I've noted it down, the problem of copyright. How can you say it's yours? You know what I mean? When there have been maybe one or two or five or even ten spirits involved in this process as well. Many musicians frequently admit that they all of a sudden have this inspiration that all just flows to them and they write it all down and they know that it came from somewhere outside of themselves. Many musicians admit it. Not many writers admit it, but many musicians admit that. And many poets uh, admit that. And some artists also admit that. And these are things that are all to do with collaboration through the law of attraction. In the end, we can all collaborate with all of these type of experiences. 
And so Eckhart Tolle and others, like most others who have written books on Earth, uh, have all done it through this process of inspiration. So, and they will admit that too. And many times they feel the inspiration pass through them. I think uh, Wayne Dyer wrote something about it in one of his books about, about the power of intention and how things just come to him and just came to him and he didn't know where they came from. And that, that was that spirit collaboration that's occurring constantly. Yeah. Matt? As we, everyone here, as we move through our own development and, you know, with our soul condition, do we all become more naturally mystic? Yes. Everyone becomes more naturally mediumistic, more naturally musical, more naturally artistic, more naturally poet, po a poet, and so forth. These are all different parts of the soul that you will find yourself developing as you progress on the divine love path as well. So, so instead of your life being a life where everything's happening in the brain, you will find your life starting to be everything that's happening at the soul level, at the emotional, experiential level. And that's a normal part of that process of growth on the divine path. So this is why I said in the first century that if you receive divine love, everything else will be added to you. Uh, and when I say everything else, we're talking everything else. All the information of the universe, you know, all of these beautiful <coughs> gifts, all of these artistic gifts and qualities, music and so forth and art, and all of these different things all will come to you as a part of developing that gift. And you'll feel them within you happening. yesterday's conversation. Yesterday's conversation was about the law of attraction. These spirits are dancing in your lounge room because of your law of attraction. Right? So what you need to do is... A, yeah. So it's actually something you've attracted to yourself in order to deal with. So they're great. They're actually helping you work through your emotional condition. You've admitted that part of it is a fear. So there's a fear they want you to address. They're helping you to address whatever their condition is in. Your law of attraction is helping you to, to attract spirits which, remember I said yesterday, intensify your emotional condition. So if my emotional condition is one of fear and I'm mediumistic, I'll be attracting a heap of spirits which will trigger my fear. So what I need to do then is allow the fear to be processed. Does that make sense to everyone? Allow yourself to feel the fear to, and allow it to actually be processed emotionally. Which is going to mean you'll be shaking, you, you know, you might have all sorts of physical responses. Keep breathing diaphragmatically, release this fear from you. So if I put my intention and my attention on my soul condition, and I feel the fear, and I feel the fear come in, and I attach myself to that, then it's my protection. Exactly. Now, of course, you can pray to God for protection. So all of you have the ability to long for God for protection, and you'll receive it. All right? But you need to ask yourself, all right, you need to say to yourself, all right, my law of attraction is, I've brought this into my life, there's an emotion there. So you can ask for God protect, for protection and you will receive that protection. But that needs to be, you need to bear in mind in that entire process that you still have a law of attraction. And your law of attraction is there to expose the emotion. So you need to feel the emotion. And it always gets back to that point. Is there somewhere in this whole process a sure knowing that comes? A sure knowing that differentiates between you... Um, yeah, I worry about whether I'm imagining things. Yeah. When you make the transition between the seventh and the eighth sphere, everything goes from faith into reality. 
So, so what, what, you know what I mean by faith? Faith is, faith is thinking you, or feeling something is true, but you don't really know it yet. But you have this feeling it's true. It's like a, and a, a Paul, the Apostle Paul said when he was on earth, it's the assured expectation of things hoped for. In other words, you believe in all your mind that what you're hoping for is a reality. That's faith. Well, it becomes reality in the transition between the seventh and the eighth sphere. So what happens there is you, you, you have this transformation that occurs between those two locations where what you thought was real becomes real. It's like the difference between knowing you can walk through the wall and actually walking through the wall. Right? Then, you don't, then you do it without thinking. So, so that's the transition that occurs in the born again transition. The, the transition between the seventh and the eighth sphere. Until then you will go through doubts and you will go through issues with you know, wondering whether it's true or not true and not really knowing and hoping that it's true and all sorts of things. And you will learn as you grow to trust more and more and more and more what you're receiving. And the same applies as a medium. That's the case. So all of you who are developing as mediums, one thing you'll need to bear in mind, and that is you're not going to be perfect at the start, right? And even for a long time you might not be perfect. And if you don't experiment, you expect yourself to be perfect right at the beginning. It's going to be quite difficult. So you need to give, out, give away these expectations of being perfect. Give away these expectations that you shouldn't be wrong. The truth is you're going to be wrong because your condition as yet isn't into an alignment condition. And even then, if you're transmitting information from higher spirits, you don't know what their feelings are. So you still might feel transmit something incorrectly. Because obviously it's very dependent upon the differential between their condition and your condition as to what you will accurately transmit. So get used to being wrong. It's about good naturedness too, isn't it? Totally. Yeah. Because Be happy in the whole process. You say things out, out of good intention when you have an interaction here on earth. Yeah, so, not always though, do we? Well, <coughs> like yesterday, our conversation didn't have many good intentions. Had good intentions. Didn't it? The emotions being expressed weren't, were they? No, they no. weren't. No, okay. So it's not always the case, but, but it's obviously. About, all this is about good naturedness. Yeah, as our condition grows, as yeah. our condition grows, obviously our intention improves and it becomes more loving. And as that intention improves, Obviously, that's going to attract a whole group of information and spirits that are, have also that same kind of intention. Certainly. Yeah. Someone else had their hand up. Surely, when you get to that level, that chance where she's seeing spirits in the house, you have the right to ask them to just go away or to go to sleep there. Why ask somebody to go away when your law of attraction brought them there? I don't think that's very fair myself. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that like when the neighbours in the store downstairs having a party and oh, it's they the same. party and you don't? Yeah, well I, I feel the same about that too. Okay. Why would you firstly address your law of attraction, then go and tell them. But I, ironically, what will happen to you, even with the neighbours idea, if you deal with your law of attraction, they'll leave anyway. So you know how many of you are having neighbours are you know party till three hours, three o'clock in the morning? That's your law of attraction, right? So if you deal with the emotion they're triggering in you, they'll stop doing that. So how many of you go out and yell at them? You know that's a good method, but it doesn't work very well because they keep doing the same thing the next day because your law of attraction is the same, you see, and it's the same with the spirits. So so the spirits that are being attracted to me, they're just there. They're just there to intensify my emotion, just like anyone else. Sure, you can ask them to leave. Many of them won't listen to you. <coughs> Will they? Well, would you? Like, let's say, you know, you feel, ah, oh, this is a cool place, this is a cool place. Like, there's, there's some drugs in the corner that I can connect to any spirit. Any, any person that comes along and has some marijuana on the corner there, I can connect with them, that's great. There's a heap of blues in the other corner, and when they have a big party, I can connect with them, that's great too. And like this, this is the spirits. This is what they're feeling. And so, so then you come in and you look at all this going on. You say, "Get out! Get out! Get out!" They're going to say, "Laugh at you, aren't they?" Half of them will laugh at you, aren't they? Some of them who are afraid of you might get out, but the other half will just say, well, "What are you saying? Get out! We're, we're enjoying ourselves." And it's our law of attraction. It's our law of attraction that's attracting that. 
So deal with the emotion. What's the emotion going on? Gary thinks. If you start off with your wow, then you channel something wrong, and it's like a little bit of untruth, and then it affects somebody, mm -hmm. you keep doing that. Does that uh, more of a conversation um, come in there? What's my intention, and what's my modesty going to do? If I'm channeling something and I know my condition is still not at one, then I have to say to every person I'm channeling to, look, I can't guarantee that this information is exactly what the Spirit is saying to me. That's a proviso, isn't it, that, that begins in every message until I'm a one, surely. Right? However, if I'm connecting to a second sphere spirit and I know I'm in a second sphere condition, I know the channeling is going to be pretty accurate, right? Because we're in the same condition, we have the greatest rapport. Look at also the intention. What's my intention? Is my intention to harm the person or is it my intention to give the most accurate information that I'm possible to give, that is possible for me in my current condition to give? And you could say that to the people who come. You can say, look, my intention here is to give you the most accurate possible information that I can possibly give you given my current condition. And then when you give them the information, whose responsibility is it now? It's now their responsibility, isn't it? And by the way, it's also their law of attraction. So if there is some error in it, actually part of it that created that error is their own law of attraction, which they would need to allow themselves to feel through. So the key is to not be afraid of saying the truth. If the truth is I'm not, I, I know that I've got a certain emotion in me or I've got certain emotions in me that are going to affect it, just say I know I'm not yet at this point where I'm totally clear but I think you will be impressed with the information that we can transmit. But bear in mind that there might be things in it that are due to my emotional condition. You can say these things. Don't be afraid of saying it. In fact, humility would dictate that you say it, wouldn't it? And then you don't have to have any fear about whether you're wrong or not, because you've already told them that there is a potential you're going to be wrong. And then it rests on the hearer as to what they're going to do. So many of you have, like I've told you over and over in these groups, I am not yet at one again with God. So there, all of the things I'm saying to you, there is the potential for me having to change them some down the, sometime down the track, is there not? Right? And all of you need to bear that in mind. However, I am very close to the condition and I know I am, but you don't have to believe me. You will feel it if you trust your soul. You will feel what I'm saying is truth or... You know, you'll feel the resonance going on. And anyway, it's your law of attraction. <laughs> so look at that. You see what I'm saying? It's the same principles with any interaction that you have with anyone. With regard to healing, though, for a moment, I'd just like to talk about healing. What's actually happening with a lot of healing is that when we're healing, so let's say I'm the, the, the healer on earth, I have a spirit with me. All healing occurs through a spirit, by the way, unless you connect directly to God and then it's through the divine love connection. Now obviously that is not going to work purely until you're at one with God. Until that point you will be assisted by spirits. Now the spirits who want to heal the material body are going to be spirits who are not on the divine path. And the spirits who want to heal the spirit body are going to be spirits who are not on the divine path. Because what does a spirit on the divine path want to do? He wants to heal the soul. Now that spirit on the divine path is very happy to heal the material body and heal the spirit body as long as the soul condition is being addressed. But if the person, the person being healed, refuses to address the soul condition, the ethical question I have to ask myself as the healer is, do I want to be involved in healing this person? The reason why I need to ask that question is because if I am trying to heal a person who doesn't want to address their soul condition, straight away I'm in disharmony with divine love, so I'm now only harmonious with natural love. Secondly, a spirit who's going to heal the person will be a natural love spirit. 
Thirdly, I'm going to heal their spirit body or their material body. Their soul is not going to be healed. And what's going to be recreated? The same illness, most probably. So in fact, it's not a very wise use of my own time. However, if I'm charging money for it, I might be tempted. <coughs> Can you see how money mixed into the deal causes some conflict inside of us? Grant. What I experience is like my, I don't get words and, and things like that in my communication. It comes through its feelings. Mm -hmm. And I have, putting it into words seems like having to chop out the tree, you know? Exactly. And so I've been trying to, to, to understand how I can pass it on in some way that doesn't involve words. And, and when you're talking about healing now, I'm just thinking, well, that's just soul-to-soul -soul mediumship, which you're then taking it to the soul of the person you're healing. So exactly. So in that sense, healing is just another form of mediumship. Exactly, that is correct. Healing is another form of mediumship. And you may be more attracted to healing than mediumship once you know that. Because, it, because what's actually happening when you start healing at the soul level is you will be able to trigger certain emotions in the person just by putting your hands over certain areas and having this soul intention with divine love flowing through you. This is why a lot of people find that when they come up to speak to me, they weren't crying before they came to speak to me, but they come and speak to me and they're crying. What happened? There's this soul thing going on that straight away is just opening their own soul. Does that make sense? And, and you're healing the person straight away. So you will get to a stage where there's no longer having to lay them down, do a little ritual, you know, get everything <laughs> settled out, do a bit of this and that. None of that will happen. Once you become a healer and one with God, everything will happen instantly and it will be based on soul-to-soul -soul transactions. That's why in the first century, there's no record of me ever having to lay somebody down in front of me to, to actually heal them or anything like that. Most of the time they just touched me and I could feel their intention. The soul feels the intention straight away. Their emotion is cleared. Divine love enters them. They're healed from that particular ailment. And it's their faith, and that's one thing I'd like to point out, is their faith rose their soul condition to a point where that was able to occur. And that's why it's often called faith healing. Because what happens when you have faith is your soul condition actually rises beyond its current point for a temporary period of time. Because right? remember what faith was. Faith was the assured expectation of things hoped for. So in other words, you believe with all your heart that you're going to get healed of this particular ailment. That raises your condition to a new level. And straight away that allows more divine love to flow through you and throw through the person who's healing you. Does that make sense to everyone? So that's why faith works. That's why no faith doesn't work. right? Because it keeps you at your current condition, so there's more effort required then to heal you. So faith is a very powerful conduit. It's actually a physical conduit for love. It's very much like the Holy Spirit in that regard. You follow me? Like the Holy Spirit, remember, I've described as a physical connection that occurs between you and God that allows love to flow through you. The Holy Spirit is, is dependent upon truth. That's why it's called the Spirit of Truth. Well, faith is a very, very, has a very similar quality in nature in that it's a physical conduit that's established that allows love to flow. Right? So, getting back to your uh, question, or your statement, probably a better way of putting it, yes, you are right. You will probably find, and many will find, that mediumship becomes less important to them and this soul-to-soul -soul interaction which actually exposes the emotion immediately and gets the person in a causal emotion at that instant is actually far more effective. Mediumship becomes effective when you're actually transmitting to groups of people information or transmitting to groups of spirits information. It becomes very effective. But healing is very effective on a one-to-one, -one, on a one-to-one -one thing, trying to help a person experience emotionally. And that's that's something that's very important. Um, Carol first, and then up the back. Yeah. AJ, from a healing perspective, 
Certainly. But if, if, if a person came to me and said, I want to be healed, and I'd ask them, I, my first question would be, do you want to deal with your emotions? Now, if they said, oh, well, I'm hoping you'll heal me, you know, I won't have to deal with my emotions. <laughs> I would have to say to them, well, actually, your problem is caused by your emotions. Do you realise that? And I'd have that discussion with them and look at their willingness to actually address that issue. If they can't address that issue, then I would not heal them. Now, the reason why is, if I choose to, I'm out of harmony with divine love. And I don't want to be out of harmony with divine love. And this is where, in the future, many people are going to become confused with the healings that are performed by people, who, well, the 14 who have returned. Because all of their healings will be based in harmony with all the laws of divine love, and at times we will refuse to heal people. And in the first century, there is records in the Bible that I actually refused to heal people. And I did that for that reason. They were totally unwilling to deal with the emotional condition that's creating the problem, and usually had a demanding nature, where they were demanding my healing to them. And some of you have had personal conversations with me where you've demanded things from me and not found me very receptive <laughs> to that. And that is because it's an unloving thing for you to demand something of someone else. And I don't want to help you be unloving by actually giving you what you demand. Right? And this will happen a lot in your own interactions when you're healing. Does that make sense? So, so, so yes, your law of attraction brings this person to you. However, your law of attraction might have brought them to you to test one thing inside of you, and that is whether you're going to compromise truth for the sake of money, for example. So it might not be the person coming to you for healing that is your law of attraction. It might actually be that there is a certain quality inside of you that needs to be refined that this person, through your interaction with them, will refine. Yeah, but see, the question I'm asking you is, when you know the divine laws, and you know what the divine laws are actually saying to you at an emotional level, right? So at the moment, you don't know them at the emotional level. So it's fine what you're doing. But when you know them at the emotional level, you are going to be confronted with this question, ethical question, which is, am I going to get myself out of harmony with divine love in order for them to get in, to, to be healed? Now, love, one of the things we talk, we talk about lessons of love in a fortnight's time, and one of the lessons of love is, if I'm loving you to the detriment of myself, then that's not love anymore, and I'm doing it for another reason. And it's also going to be not a very powerful place for you or I to be in. So that is a question that will face you ethically. Right? I'm not saying you have to deal with that question right now, but at the moment there's a feeling in you, if I can heal, then that's fantastic. But I don't feel that. I don't feel that. Because their law of attraction has caused their disease. In fact, the way I see it is that God's laws have caused their disease through their interaction with God's laws. Their choices, interacting with God's laws, have created the disease. And the question I'm asking myself is, is God healing them? Now, God loves every one of his children. And if he's not healing you, there's a, there's a question as to what I should be doing healing you. Can you see that? Right? So I would rather address the emotional issues in you as to why God's not healing you. And then God can heal you directly and you don't even need me at all. That would be a far more powerful place for the person than me actually healing them. And that's, my, that's the, the ethical dilemma that you will face as a healer. 
Does everyone follow that? Like, you can see that interaction. So, so what's actually happening for us most of the time when we're doing, dealing with these questions is we have a needy feeling inside of myself. We, we feel a compassion for that illness. We have a needy feeling in my side of myself to heal that illness, but we're often not very much thinking or feeling about why God isn't already healing this illness. Because God has a lot more power than you do to heal. So the question then becomes, why isn't God doing it? There must be a reason. Now if I do it without addressing those reasons, then I'm going to be out of harmony with God's will. Sorry? Only treating the symptoms. I'm only treating the symptoms, the effects, and not the cause for a start. But also I'm out of harmony with God's will for that person. Because the truth is our law of attraction is bringing us everything anyway. So when I'm healing, and this applies to my mediumship as well, if I'm focusing on what God would do in this situation, right, as well as, as best to my ability, what is God doing right now? Do you, think, do you think if I needed to be healed right now and there wasn't something in me resisting that healing, don't you think God would be healing me already? Like, does God love me or not? Of course God does, so God would be healing me already. So if I'm not healed, so I'm not healed from this, right? From this. So why aren't I healed from this? Because I have resistance. There's something in me that's resisting me getting healed from this. Now let's say I go, I go to a healer, I want my eyesight healed. And let's say it's a divine love healer on the divine love path, who's at one with God. And what would they have to ask themselves? I'm on the divine path, they're on the divine path. I've got bung eyes that I can't see the back of the room and they've got clear sight, they're at one with God. I'm both, we're both on the path. Why isn't God healing me? Because I'm resisting it. There's an emotion in me that I'm not willing to deal with that is causing this issue. And is it wrong for them to interfere with that process? Not interfere with the process. They could tell me what the emotion is. That would be a very powerful thing to do. They could, they could even help me. They could say, now, are you willing to deal with this emotion? And if I said yes, and I felt yes, they could say, all right, let's go ahead and we'll deal with this emotion. And away I'd go and I'd be dealing with the emotion and I would get healed. That's a very powerful thing to do. But if I said, if they said, are you willing to deal with the emotion? I said, what emotion? I don't have any emotions left. I'm right. You know, then I've got an issue, haven't I? I'm not recognising my own law of attraction. So it then becomes very questionable for the person who's at one with God to heal me. How can they stay at one with God and heal me? They can't, actually. And so they would have to, actually, at some point, confuse, unless I was willing to do, bring myself in the condition of harmonious with God's love myself. Can everyone see that? Yeah. That interaction that's going on there. So the question you ask yourself, God has this unlimited power, right? God has this unlimited love for you. So if you're not getting healed right now, why? It's because of something you're resisting inside of yourself. Now, if I know what that is, I'm going to try to tell you what that is. Because that is an act of love for me. Right? And if you know what it is for someone else, it's an act of love for you to tell them what it is. For them too. But if you try to heal them using this love that you have, this divine love, it won't be God's love that you'll be doing. You'll be using your own energy to heal them. Right? And because the soul condition has not changed, they're most likely going to get the problem back anyway. Okay. Um, That's because you want to understand. And you need to give up the need to understand and just feel. But go on with your question. <laughs> I'm not telling you what you should do with your healing. Like I'm not, what you do with your healing is your choice. I'm only telling you what I would do with my healing and, I've, and what you would do if you were at one with God with your healing. Because you will feel these emotions that I feel about that. 
Now at the moment you do not feel those emotions, so you need to choose to do what you want to do. But I am saying to you that once you're at one with God, the first priority in your questions will be, why isn't God already doing it? That'll be your first priority. I would refuse to help a person who only wants their headache taken away. Yes. Why? What's creating their headache? It's a suppression usually of sadness, not wanting to cry. That's usually what creates their headache, right? They have deep sadness in them. They don't want to cry. They're fighting it. They're resisting it, shoving it back down again. And, and if they don't want to have that discussion, healing their headache is a waste of time. And I don't want to waste my time, I don't know about you, but my time is precious, you know, it's the only resource actually that I have. And although I have eternity with it, I want to use it in the most possible, in the best possible process, just like God does, right? In the most economical way. And so you will get to a point where you realise that, hang on a sec, me healing a physical illness when I know there's an emotional problem is not an effective use of my time. And to be honest with you, you know what it's doing? It's taking away their law of attraction. Their law of attraction is, this headache is happening because they're suppressing their emotions, they're suppressing their sadness, and they don't want to cry. It's their blockage of resistance. That's what's causing their headache. They've come to me to fix their headache. They've come to me to fix the effect. God does not ever fix effects. God always addresses causes. So if I want to fix an effect, who am I going to be connecting to? Not God. I'll be connecting to someone else. Now, it might sound great, that I'm healing them. Oh, I've healed their headache. Isn't it wonderful? I've gone away. I want such a wonderful healer. But I've got a question. What's my motive? My motive isn't the same as God's, that's for sure. Because if it was the same as God's, I'd be addressing the cause, not the effect. And this is where we need to start addressing ourselves as healers and looking at what God would do compared to what you would do. You see what I'm saying? Can you see how challenging the next year is going to be for those who actually come to the <laughs> sessions on healing and mediumship. Because everything is going to be based around our desire to do as God do, does. Right? Now we might not yet be at one with God, but at least we can begin to have a desire to do as God does. We can start developing that within ourselves. If I have an emotion within me that I want to heal the person, irrespective of God's laws and how those laws are affecting that person, then I am actually now usurping God's laws. I'm trying to actually go above God's laws, which in itself has an emotion attached to it, of me wanting either glorification or wanting a feeling from that person that I'm addicted to. Most of the time that feeling might be a feeling of glory or a feeling, oh, I've helped them. Isn't that wonderful? You know, the, the feeling you get when you've helped somebody, you may be addicted to, and that is not love. To be addicted to any feeling is not love particularly if there's a feeling from the other person. It is not love. So I may be choosing to do or take those actions in disharmony with God's laws because of emotions within me. And I need to look really sincerely, if I'm a healer or a medium, I need to look really sincerely inside of myself as to why my motive would be to do something that I know is not harmonious with what God would do. Because the question is always, is God already doing it? If not, then he doesn't want to. Why wouldn't he want to? He's always love. If God's always love and always wants to, but doesn't do it, then what's going on? There's something in the person preventing this action from occurring that's disharmonious with love. That's what I need to address. And this is why it's so important to look at those issues. Does that make sense, Karen? It's a really important issue to, to actually grasp. Yeah. Uh, this will be the last question, by the way. Hey, Joe, I just wanted to ask, if your intention is to do healing work, mm -hmm. um, and mine in particular is with children, mm -hmm. I eventually want to be able to do that, so I'll go wait till I become one of the to do that no. effectively. But, yeah, to do it effectively, the best possible way you will, but you don't have to wait till then. In fact, I'm not suggesting you need to wait at all. Yeah. Yes. So, um, and probably for other people in the room too, they will want you to do that with people. Yep. Um, you know, can several of us 
join this group or do we... Yeah, no, it, anybody who wants to do these things, join the group. But realise that it's going to be a program, so it's going to be a monthly program type thing where you'll be developed in certain areas. Do you follow me? Yeah. So come along, certainly. So it's not limited to just people who are already doing it or anything like that. If you want to do it, come along by all means. It will usually be an addition to a weekend. So, so if you're feeling exhausted in a weekend already, then you might find an addition to the weekend uh, a bit difficult. But we're, one thing I need to now discuss is how many people are actually interested in it. So if you could just raise your hands. Okay. So there's probably about 60 of you. Okay, that's good. Um, so we will have to get a venue each time. So probably what we will do is we'll also try to tag it around the location that we're doing a talk. And uh, how many of you would find it more convenient if we did it Friday night before a Saturday? Or, or a Sunday talk? Or, or Monday night? What, who, would, who would prefer the Friday night? So a fair majority of others. Who would prefer the Monday night? Just a few. I'm sorry about the Monday nighters. It looks like it's going to be a Friday night thing. Sometimes what we'll be doing is actually making it, uh, instead of a Saturday or a Sunday, we'll actually make it a part of the program because it'll be something that all the people in the audience may want to know more about. So we'll actually incorporate it into a weekend. Other times we'll either do it on a Friday night, uh, we'll do it probably on a Friday night as part of it. Now, because of the numbers, um, uh, we'll obviously have to have a venue, so we'll probably either make, either if Peter will be willing to give his venue for the times we're at Udlo, and the times when we're down your way, we'll have to find a venue in Brisbane. So sometimes it will be here and sometimes it will be in Brisbane, by the way, over the, coming, over the coming 12 months. So that's something just to bear in mind as well. Um, now obviously if the venue is required, then there'll be a cost associated with that, so it'll be reliant on your donations as to whether we can keep that process going. Um, so um, now the other thing I wanted to do is just introduce James to you. If you could come up, James. Um, now some of you met James yesterday uh, sure. when he came up to talk about vaccinations and so forth that he was been giving <laughs> and working through the law of conversation about. <laughs> um, so James is a doctor. Um, and also very passionate medium. And he's been developing his mediumship over the past a year or so since we've known each other more yeah. so probably than before. But he's had a long experience with natural love mediumship yeah. and healing. So um, that's the why, reason why I've asked James to be involved in this. Now what will be happening is if I'm not around, whatever I've actually talked about with James, James will be talking to the group about. Now, James has uh, a, a divine love guide with him as St. Francis, or Francis is his guide. And so a lot of what will be happening is that James will actually be giving you exercises to do with your guides that Francis will actually be suggesting. Right? Because Francis is actually helping James work through yeah. his stuff. Yeah, he's uh, doing some interesting things and just... Uh Recently, I, I realized that in receiving from Francis, I was trying to control what was happening. And as soon as I realized that, I thought, this is a nonsense. And so I, I handed it over to Francis, who then just started to dictate nonsense to me. I was typing it down, just went all over the place, too. Uh, and it was crazy, and I, it really blew my mind, and I felt just out of control. And so I had to really focus on, on feeling out of control. And, um, and he's still doing that at the moment and saying that this is a process of preparation and uh, every now and then he changes the pace and then I start to make many more mistakes in my typing and I have to come back to the control issues again and every now and then it's, it switches from him to another guide who comes in just to ring the changes and see if I pick up the difference in the feeling state. And then, as soon as I zip into my head, he lets me know right away. I mean, my head, because I know that already. But <laughs> this is you're in your head. Get back down in there. And, uh, so it's, it's a fascinating process. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think many of you mediums will be fascinated by the process as well. When it comes to healing, 
Um, I think you'll be quite fascinated by that process too of what we'll go through with those particular things with healing as well. So, and that's something that we'll be doing in conjunction with some celestial spirits as well. So what we want to do in the end is get to the point where all of you who are involved in this are actually being taught by celestial spirits how to actually do it in harmony with divine love rather than hearing it from me. So that's the really goal at the end. So James will be involved in organising them. The email address, brisbane at divinetruth.com, is the uh, email address for any all of the events in Brisbane. But what we might do is make a uh, another email address, yeah. perhaps called uh, mediumship or, or mediums or or what should we call it? Out of this world. Out of this world. <laughs> Out of this world. Okay. <laughs> what do you want me to set that up on my ISP? Or? I can set it up. You can set it up. Okay. So um, I'll write down one that we'll set up. Uh, and that will be specifically for these groups. So the Brisbane address will be for the Brisbane seminars, whereas this particular thing will be called, say, something like mediums at, and that will be for this particular thing of developing mediumship and, and healing abilities. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. What's going on there? Questions? I'm trying to think of the name of the movie that's about Francis and the CC. Brothers, 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 Brothers,
during the month that you're away from the group, focus on developing these different things and use the group as a forum to actually discuss what the effectiveness is of what you've learned and then also to, we'll be presenting new things to try for the next month. So you're going to need to be prepared like like to do homework, you know, basically. Yeah, to, to actually, yeah, to actually get into the process of doing it quite regularly. Yeah. So what realistically, what are we looking at as a time commitment here? Um, we'll probably have one to two hour sessions uh, when we meet. Um, probably they'll finish up being two hours, I'll say. I think so. Um, and, and then after that, it's up to you what you do with what you've learned. But obviously, the more you do with it, the more fun you're going to have with it, and the more effective you're going to become. Yeah. So what can I say that one of the first things Francis said to me was avoid caffeine, avoid alcohol, avoid heavy foods. So if you're coming along to one of the nights, stay away from meat, anything meat, dairy, if you can, and also avoid alcohol and coffee. Uh, anything with caffeine in it, avoid, yeah. Um, the reason why is all of these things change the structure of your, uh, of your physical body and your spiritual perception and the reason why is because it is affected by your soul condition as to why you want to take those things that particular night. You follow me? So you're, any addiction to caffeine, any addiction to food that's heavy, any, any meat products and so forth and, and animal products, your desire to have them is based on an emotional condition which will prevent your mediumship from growing. 